Hi everyone, Adam from RethinkX here. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to look at some key ideas around solving climate change. So let's dive right in. In previous episodes, I've talked about three inconvenient truths that set the context for understanding what we need to do as a civilization to fully solve climate change. The first inconvenient truth is that even if we zeroed out all of our greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, many of the worst impacts of climate change would still occur. The damage we've already caused may well have set us on a collision course with planetary tipping points, like ice sheet collapse, permafrost melting, that could take centuries to recover naturally on their own without our proactive intervention. The second inconvenient truth, which follows directly on, is that mitigation alone is not enough. We also have a huge amount of restoration work to do. In other words, it's not enough just to stop harming the planet. We have to heal it too, and soon, not slowly over centuries, but within the next few decades. And the third inconvenient truth following on from the first two is that it's physically impossible to solve climate change by reducing consumption alone. Doing less, including less harm, isn't enough. We're long past the point where we can avert catastrophe merely by downgrading our individual lifestyles or imposing stricter rules on corporate and state polluters. No amount of bicycling to work or regulatory standards will pull a single gram of carbon out of the atmosphere, just as no amount of firefighting will repair a house that's already been burned. Okay, so with those three things, fresh in mind, let's continue here and talk about eight other key points that are crucial for understanding how to fully solve climate change. First and foremost by far is that the only way to fully solve climate change is through prosperity, not austerity. Energy, transportation, and food account for nearly 90% of all global emissions today. Now, obviously, we should always strive to be less wasteful. That goes without saying. But the idea that cutting back, tightening our belts, or otherwise imposing austerity measures across the economy and society will solve climate change is nonsensical. As we've covered in previous episodes, austerity, doing less, consuming less, it won't work. It can't work logically. And it will only make things worse because the loss of prosperity will make tackling big challenges like climate change harder. Harder, not easier. Instead, the only way to eliminate emissions altogether, to fully get to zero, is with clean energy, transportation, and food. And that means embracing and accelerating clean technology and disruption. It's also important to remember that as the disruptions proceed, everything gets cheaper. As energy, transportation, food, and labor fall in cost, so does everything else. And that includes everything it takes to solve problems. So one of the greatest benefits of expanding prosperity is that problems become solvable because their solutions become affordable. The second key point is that we can achieve net zero emissions much more quickly than is widely imagined. The technologies we need to solve climate change are not science fiction, they're science fact. We don't need fusion power or room temperature superconductors or any other exotic tech. We just need to deploy and scale what we already have. Solar power, wind power, and batteries in the energy sector electric vehicles, autonomous driving and ride hailing in the transportation sector, precision fermentation and cellular agriculture in the food sector, and accelerating all of those, automation in the labor sector. Third, the immense power of markets can now do the heavy lifting for us. Disruptions happen when new technologies emerge that are better and cheaper and thus outcompete older ones. And what that means is that once they pass the tipping point of being cost competitive, 
disruptive technologies have market forces working for them rather than against them. Now, this is extremely good news for climate change because clean tech decarbonization driven by market forces will work far better than any attempt to enforce draconian restrictions on either the supply side or the demand side of the economy. Even better, it means that the transformation will be swift. Throughout history, we've seen over and over again that disruptions tend to run their course in just 15 to 20 years for technologies of all kinds. Fourth, a focused approach is better than an all of the above approach. History and common sense both clearly indicate that it's much more effective to concentrate on a single strategy than to spread ourselves thin with mediocre efforts across a dozen different fronts. In fact, the only reason why we ever employ an all of the above approach to tackle any problem is out of desperation. When there's no single focused strategy available that will actually work. And up until recently, that was perfectly true for climate change. It was just too big of a problem for us to get our arms around. But disruption has changed that. And the single strategy we should focus on now is simple. Deploy and scale those clean technologies to disrupt energy, transportation, and food as quickly as possible. Fifth, the same technologies that enable mitigation also enable restoration. And this is happening in four, four fundamental sectors simultaneously. As they unfold, they will raise the tide of prosperity and productivity across the board. And that will make all problems easier to solve. Up until now, the scope and cost of climate restoration just seemed overwhelming. It's one of the key reasons why the scientific community avoided talking about that topic for so long. But the same technologies that will disrupt energy, transportation, and food will also reduce the cost of carbon withdrawal. Restoration in the form of reforestation, of ocean alkalinity enhancement, the candidates my team thinks are the best options at present, the cost of those will plummet thanks to the disruptions. Our analysis suggests they could fall below $10 per ton of carbon withdrawn by the mid-2040s. That's extraordinary, and it makes solving climate change fully vastly more feasible. Sixth, decarbonizing the global economy won't be costly. That's a widespread myth. It will instead save trillions of dollars. Why? Because clean technologies Driving disruptions were expensive in the past, but that's no longer the case today. There is no green premium to pay here. The disruptions will naturally save us, save us trillions of dollars, purely in avoided economic costs, because that's what disruptions do. That's why they are disruptions. The new technologies are cheaper and better and outperform the older ones. And that's just the direct economic costs. In this case, the added bonus of also being clean means that these disruptions will save trillions of dollars of externalized costs as well, environmental and social both. And remember, in the case of the environment, it's not just climate change. We're talking about air pollution, water pollution, car accidents. Those cost millions of lives per year. Seventh, carbon taxes are no longer strictly necessary. Now, while it might be a good idea, still, to make polluters pay, the disruption of fossil fuels, combustion engine vehicles, and animal agriculture is now inevitable, and for purely economic reasons. So carbon taxes are, they're no longer needed to solve climate change. In fact, they could backfire. They could end up doing more harm than good if they hinder overall economic prosperity without sufficiently turbocharging the disruptions to compensate. Now, that may be a bitter pill for we environmentalists to swallow because, well, at least part of the motivation behind carbon taxes is to bring polluters to justice through financial retribution. But at this point, it's probably more rational to spend our political capital on accelerating the disruptions directly and on securing other important but less sexy environmental protections than carbon taxes. 
And finally, eighth, the four clean technology disruptions ahead of us mean that we don't have to trade off ecological well-being and human well-being against each other. Unlike in the past, the more prosperous we are going forward now, based on clean energy, transportation, food, and labor, the more we can utilize that prosperity to both mitigate and restore climate and tackle other major environmental challenges as well. It also means that we don't have to condemn anyone anywhere in the planet to a lower quality of life, a life with less, a life with less prosperity. And it directly follows that if societies choose, we can use the same prosperity we build with new technology to close wealth, income, and disparity gaps at the same time. So not only can we solve climate change without a terrible economic cost, we can solve climate change without a terrible social cost either. And that point, I think, is what matters most of all. Up until now, the gloom and doom around climate change has been centered on the belief that it's a no-win scenario. But the disruptions of energy, transportation, food, and labor change the game. With those new clean technologies, humanity and the natural world can both thrive together. And that is a brighter future worth being excited about. Well, that's it for today. You know the drill. Hit those like and subscribe buttons. They really do help amplify the impact of our work. Thanks everyone for watching. And just remember, the future is brighter than you think. We'll see you all next time. Take care.